Hello everyone, welcome. I'm assuming that there is somebody on the other side. Um, I don't see anybody, but welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Valentina Cardo and I am Associate Professor of Politics and Identity at the Winchester School of Art at the University of Southampton. Um, and today, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll be chairing this very exciting event on behalf of Winchester School of Art. Um, and I'm doing that as, um, as the co-chair of the uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion uh, um, uh, part of the um, Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Uh, so, so as you know, this is a Black History Month event and um, in a nutshell, you'll know it, I'm gonna tell you anyway, is um, celebrates the contribution of black communities uh, within the UK. And um, in celebration of Black History Month, um, we, uh, Winchester School of Art has several events and uh, the faculty has several events. And today is that our launching event. Uh, so that's very exciting for us. Um, and, uh, and this event features a conversation more than an interview. I, I, I'm sorry if I was misleading in my um, labeling of, of an interview with Nahem Shoa. Um, because really it's a conversation that we're having with Nahem or, or, or a very intense interview that will be done uh, by a panel. Uh, and now there is very much to say about Nahem and I really enjoyed finding out about his work and his life. And, um, you know, the past few weeks I've been kind of dipping in and out of, 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 of this and it was a, a real eye opener for me, um, lots of very new, very interesting things that I found there that I didn't know. Um, so I'm not gonna say everything about Nahum. Obviously, uh, I hope I'll do you justice, Nahum. I'm just gonna uh, say a couple of things by way of introducing the event. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and I know that the panel will want to explore uh, a number of these. Uh, so Nahum is a visual artist. Uh, he started out as a graffiti artist in London and uh, then transitioned, I hope that's the right um, word, onto oil painting. And um, um, he, he comes from a multicultural and racially mixed background uh, and uh, uh, lived and, and still lives in multicultural London. Um, and this, I think, uh, perhaps, uh, I hope that's okay to say, it's kind of uh, uh, perhaps something that uh, led you to kind of thinking about mainstreaming multi multiculturalism, in other words, to show the diversity instead of being something that only applies to a few of us is actually something that uh, a lot of us, a lot of us shares. It's, it's part of our daily lives. Um, so, and so in this sense, and I'm, you know, takes diversity uh, really seriously and, and, and has been a keen observer of, of a number of, of, of diversities. Uh, but um, something close to my heart, he's been a, a, a critic of the difficulties that women painters and, and, and models face in the old boys club, uh, old white boys club, I should add. Um, so uh, now I'm uh, lost long, st long standing interest in redressing this lack of uh, diversity in the art world and his wish to see a greater number of non-white artists um, represented in public institutions and exhibitions, I think comes through very well through the uh, his curation of uh, Face of Britain. And the exhibition is hosted in uh, the Southampton uh, City Art Gallery. Um, and the gallery is uh, has an 81 year history and an art collection that spans uh, Western European art from the 14th century uh, to the present day. Uh, in 2016, Naim uh, offered to the gallery's painting uh, head of uh, Desmond Horton and um, outlined his vision for a greater ethnic diversity of artists and subjects in UK public collections. And in Faces of, uh, Face of Britain, which we're seeing uh, a walkthrough now uh, of, of the exhibition, uh, Naim sought to celebrate diversity in British society. Um, and his work, as well as his curation of the gallery, makes an important several important contributions to discourses of race, politics, and art history. So um, I'm, I'm going to wait until this uh, uh, this finishes. By the way, um, I want to thank uh, uh, Tom Lava. Um, he's an assistant curator uh, at uh, Southampton City Gallery, um, City Arts Gallery, 
uh, for producing this uh, walkthrough of the of the gallery and uh, Naim's work and both as a curator and his own work. Okay, so um, Nahem will be joined today um, in a conversation of expert with with experts tonight. Um, the panel includes uh, uh, Professor Larry Lynch, who's the head of uh, Winchester School of Art and Professor of Performance perfor performance performance writing. Sorry, Larry. Um, uh, Rhonda Gowland Pride. Um, she is City uh, University lead and Senior Engagement Fellow at the Public Engagement and Research Unit, unit but also, uh, um, importantly, she was the former Head of Engagement and Research at John Hansard, uh, at the John Hansard Gallery for quite some time. And uh, finally, uh, the panel ha uh, uh, has um, Aria uh, Zubuga. Uh, and Aria mm -hmm. is, is a painter, a sculptor, and uh, a PhD student at Winchester School of Art and area, I understand you've just um, handed in your correction. So uh, uh, congratulations, area. Uh, uh, so, um, and of course, uh, very importantly, Naim uh, will be uh, in conversation with, with this panel. Um, now, just before I go away, uh, I want to uh, thank a couple of people. Um, Sylvia Lanati and Rima Lasadi are at the back, uh, just making all this happening. So they're working behind the scenes uh, to help us achieve uh, and, and make this event great. Um, Molly Mills actually is the person who introduced me to Nahem and uh, um, helped really help make, make this event possible. Uh, so thank you all of you. And for those of you who want to tweet or, uh, or do other things on social media with uh, this event, there is the hashtag on the bottom right of your screen. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Hello. Well, um, I think um, we've agreed uh, to kick off our conversation with Nahem with um, a little section from about the early days. So we've just heard in, in Valentina's introduction yes. that you're an artist who was charging around North London as a graffiti artist. Yes, yes. And very soon afterwards was digging into Velasquez, Goya, El Greco yeah. and Rembrandt technique with one of the, you know, the UK's more idiosyncratic and disruptive artists in Plymouth. So perhaps you could tell us about your early career and how your relationship with Lenkovich and social documentary leads you into work in the gallery. Well, you know, I was very, uh, lucky. I grew up in Notting Hill in West London, uh, which with parents that had gone to art school, the Royal College, um, they set up a fashion business there. And Notting Hill is where the carnival began. I actually remember the first, the first carnivals. They were much quieter. Um, and it's a very, very mixed uh, area. And um, it was the hippie period that so everyone was living in squats. So incredibly colorful it was it was like with Nell and I if anyone's seen the film um, and I went to schools where the class was a whole diverse range of, of nationalities so all my friends came from all different backgrounds and in that time in the early 70s that was very unusual uh, and it shaped my life and it still shapes the area now so um, uh, I was uh, had a lot of mixed race and black friends as my best friend. So I was hearing a lot of black music as a child. And uh, my uncle used to collect uh, a jazz records and things. So I would be listening to jazz. And then I got into uh, reggae, Bob Marley. And then around 1980, uh, uh, a friend of my sister, who was about five years older and was hanging out with Boy George and things, uh, played us the Sugar Hill Gang, uh, the first rap record and then this and we said wow what is this and then we started to listen to music by African Bart and Salt and Planet Rock and that just made me get into break dancing graffiti there was a film called Wild Star and I was one of the first graffiti artists in Britain probably making my first piece in 1982 my father used to hang out in a cafe called Bites and Joe Strummer from The Clash used to hang out there 
and the clash brought this graffiti artist called Futura 2000 from America to England. He probably made the first piece of graffiti in, Brit in Britain, so that just amazed me. Uh, all, and uh, there was another a dance group called The Crew in, in, uh, in my area, and they were making the first hip-hop tracks. So we all kind of joined together. We were in a crew called The Break Jam Crew, and I just fell in love with graffiti art. Uh, I still think it's the kind of punk music of, of black culture, uh, inventing a new instrument with the turntables, in a way. I think it's hasn't fully been given its credit how radical that was. It was almost a, a Dada kind of experiment, but brilliant. Um, and it's shaped music ever since. Um, so I got quite well known as a graffiti artist. I got to know all the London graffiti artists and, and ones around Britain like uh, 3D from Massive Attack, who were called, um, and uh, they were called, what were they called now? Oh, um, I forgot their names, but, but, but they basically used to do warehouse parties together uh, my, fa my father at art school had gone to art school with Robert Lenkovich at about 16. Uh, Robert Lenkovich is this kind of crazy, maverick, super skillful painter that did 3,000 square foot murals. Uh, um, and then he, ha he housed uh, uh, he housed tramps and dossers in warehouses before any charities um, were uh, looking after uh, uh, helping them at the time. So I would go to stay in the house and there would be piss pots and the smell of bodies. And we would have these amazing Christmas dinners. They were like the Last Supper. They really were like something out of the Renaissance. Uh, imagine these bearded guys in these suits. I mean, the smell, about 20 of them on this big long oak table in the 17th century house. It was very evocative. But anyway, when I got to 16, uh, I was showing Robert my graffiti pad, my, my book of graffiti, and he said, yes, Nahim, you should look at Jasper John, his numbers. And so, and he started to show me those wonderful maps and alphabets that Jasper John did. And he said, look at Jasper John. And I found it fascinating. I made my first oil painting at the time of flags, the American flag. Uh, obviously based on Jasper Johns. They said, go to the National Gallery and look at the Toilet of Venus by Velasquez. So I went uh, the next day with my mom, looked at this painting where everything is blurry. There's no feet, there's no hands. It's all suggestion. It's so mysterious, this painting. Uh, and I just said, I want to become an artist. I don't want to be a graffiti artist anymore. I want to become a painter. Uh, and it was around the time I was doing A-level art at school. And um, I would, you know, I was the good kid at art. I was the kind of, my parents had showed me a few things. And then I showed Robert my portfolio and he said, hmm, you paint with hope on the end of your brush. And I said, what do you mean? I paint with hope on the end of my brush. He said, you take 10 pictures and you hope that one of them is okay. I can put knowledge on the end of your brush. You want me to teach you? And so began my art journey. Uh, and he, he taught me about tone and color and all the craftsmanship areas. At the same time, I went on to do a foundation course and a degree course in Manchester, and much later on a postgraduate in the Royal Drawing Schools. Um, and R Robert was famous for doing projects uh, like on old age, orgasm, mental health, uh, suicide, vagrancy. And uh, in a way, he was like a precursor to, to, to British conceptual art in painting, in a way. These were conceptual projects. He had the tramps write about themselves. And, uh, you know, he and, he and exhibited what they wrote next to their pictures uh, and it, it was it was hands in like I said he would break into warehouses with them he was very strong and um, give them places to live and sleep and then he would come in with sketchbooks and draw them and then paint them and uh, and uh, well um, you know it was very inspiring when you're about eight or nine years old and when he was teaching me when I was 16 to about 24 on and off while I was at art school it, it stayed very strongly in my mind um, so yeah, Robert was a very, very important influence in my early career. And 
uh, I, what, I, what he taught me about the craft of painting was about learning to see the whole, uh, how to relate things together, how to paint from life. Um, very simply, very abstractly, uh, I mean, there, there are these academic schools in the world now that teach academic art, the Florence Academy and there are other ones, but they produce a kind of 10th rate Lord Layton, uh, very sterile, very uh, dead. I mean, the very reason why Manet and Corbet and everyone re rebelled against the 19th century salon in the first place. Uh, uh, there's a kind of way of looking at the world with, uh, and learning how to paint what you see that leads on to Lucian Freud, leads on to Frank Arbach, to Bomberg, to great modern art, to, to Impressionism, to Monet. And there's a bad way of seeing, I mean, my personal opinion, that produces a kind of art that has no emotion in it, really. Uh, it's all about skill, but there's no feeling. There's no, um, and it feels very samey. It, it doesn't allow for individual individuality, which to me, what I like about art and artists is uh, is their own personal vision, you know. I, if, if you, you know, so that's how I began, anyway. Well, perhaps one brief follow-up before Area comes in, but we're, we're, as you developed your your career and practice as a as an oil painter, um, with su substantial and significant work in portraiture, you know, perhaps informed by your relationship with Lenkovich, were you surprised to find that outside of very specific kind of bourgeois frameworks? Being a um, a committed uh, realist portrait painter within the mainstream is arguably as subversive, if not more, than being a graffiti artist. It was. I mean, it was ironic because um, you can imagine uh, the first day I got into art school, I was already I had forty students and and all the lecturers on the arguing with me on my very first day. Uh, why do you want to do this? Um, this is dead. Blah blah blah. And I just said, you know, I want to learn, basically. Uh, I, I'm following the, the modernist that I love. I, I, because I was so well read, I love Monk or I love Bonnard or I love Picasso or Matisse. And I saw how they were trained before they, and I always felt for my own, I don't think it's for everyone, but for me, for me to be free, I had to actually break away from something. Uh, so I saw it as a kind of, it was very subversive because at that time you could go to every degree course and I was one of the very, very few people working like that. Uh, but uh, in a way, I love that in a way, you know, I, 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 I find it ironic now with my, when you see these portraits now that they don't feel like looking backwards, they feel like they were looking forwards because there were people who were kind of straggling both camps like Paul Arego and, and Lucian Freud who who were, who were contemporary and traditional at the same time, uh, looking backwards and forwards. So I, I never ever thought that I wasn't part of the mainstream, if you know what I mean. I was quite, I mean, I'm just as much as any contemporary artist, I'm not a fan of portraiture in general. I don't go to see people with their, in their garden with their two children and their, and their dog sitting by them as a, as a very interesting work of art. I, I like portraiture that is that makes me look at the world in a new way so uh, Pope Innocent the X by Velasquez or or or, or uh, um, you know uh, an amazing Degas of Tissot or uh, a, a great Lucian Freud portrait of uh, Lee Bowery they they were like the weather they were like me walking into a thunderstorm I knew my world would never be the same and that's what I want from great art. I, I can get that from conceptual art, from video art. It's not uh, just portraiture that moves me. It can be cinema, Tarkovsky or Fellini or Pasolini. They had just as much inspiration on me as as painters, you know. That's great, man. Area. Oh, yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, I, I thank you. I, I I went through your exhibition just very briefly. I know it was a very short visit, the shortest visit ever. But I was just impressed about the scale of your work. You know, um, yeah. the first thing I noted, perhaps now I know that you have a background in graffiti, and graffiti is about scale. You like to, yeah. 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 So that's the first thing. But the question I'd like to ask you first is, how does your uh, your mixed heritage play into your practice like um, how do you how does it how does it affect the way that you choose your your themes you know like you you're jewish but you're also yemeni 
you know, so yeah. Lithuanian, which is a very and 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 the, and, the, and the, you know Eritrean. That's that's the African connection now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how does your identity, specific parts of that identity, play into how you practice and how you yeah, view? Well, it? I mean, yeah, I I think it's uh, deeply affected my life uh, because. I was made aware of it, even though, I mean, I felt very comfortable. I felt, uh, uh, you know, a man of the world in a way. I found it was just, you know, I loved the world and I felt having all that different blood running through me made me feel like I can be friends with everyone from a very young age. I didn't feel like judged anyone because I felt at home in so many places. But I was always being judged. Uh, I was always, always being asked the whole of my life, where are you from? Uh, from the, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I said, oh, I'm from Notting Hill. I'm, um, I'm a Londoner. But no, where, where are you from now, him? Uh, are you Moroccan? I was constantly thought to be Moroccan for the first 40 years of my life, which is which I'm very happy. I don't mind being seen as Moroccan. And you know, if it, you know, I'm very happy because I have uh, North African blood in me. So, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it it labels you. So uh, I mean, so yeah, it's. All my friends are from all these different backgrounds. It's, it, I'm not. I'm very normal amongst my own peer group uh, because uh, I have friends with very similar kind of mixtures to me, slightly different versions. They might have some African and some uh, Portuguese and some Scottish and some French. Or, but uh, yeah, it, it, it basically, I came from a world that I didn't feel was reflected in art gallery, uh, only negatively. Uh, because if you go into um, museums where you see uh, uh, people of color, either Indian or Arabian, or they're fetishized in some sort of way, they are always, they, you know, or, or they're in like racist roles, they're always a servant, they're always handing a white person, a kind of a gentleman, something, a gift, or, or they're always, they're doing the servile role, and they are secondary in art. So. Uh, I felt uh, that that culture was really affecting youth culture. So I made projects when I was in my late 20s. I realized that I was around things from, from, the, from the graffiti and from uh, uh, the breakdancing world and from the friends I was mixing in the fine art world, uh, that that aspect of Britishness or, or the modern world was not being reflected. and. It was very small in the beginning, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, in the warehouse, when I was, uh, they were called the Wild Bunch, 3D and Massive Attack were called the Wild Bunch. When I was hanging out doing warehouse parties with those kind of people, it was a very small scene of about 20,000 people probably in Britain. But it's become mainstream. I mean, you know, that kind of music has, so I just felt that it is my work, it's my life. My, uh, uh, art, art is my life, and, and my life is that world. So I have to reflect it somehow. Um, and that world has become the modern world. The world of the 21st century has been shaped by that. But but still, people of color are still very marginalized. And even now, I work in a very different way, partly from drawings, from my imagination, uh, and I take things things of views from London and people and things from magazines. I still want to reflect that. I may not be painting portraits anymore, but I still have black and mixed race people in my paintings. I don't yeah. need to go to, because I don't need to go to Tahiti to find paradise or I, I find it in London. London is my, yeah. uh, I still think London is one of the great melting pots of the world and the meeting point where we can all shake hands and learn from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh, oh, sorry. Um, that, that I hope I, I hope I didn't interrupt. I wanted to ask a follow up. Um, um, I'm I'm from Uganda. I'm from one of the less known countries in the world. I mean, in art, in art and everything else. And um, I completely understand what you were, were feeling as when you talk, when you talked about um, the art either being fetishized or the art that is in a ne negative uh, portrayal. So, so I was I wanted to ask you a, a, a bit. I'm sort of trying to connect it to something else, but maybe maybe before we go, I want to ask this question. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, Chika Okeke Agulu has said African art is being gentrified right now. Yeah, and and by that he means that it is uh, it's sort of 
it is now a, a big thing now in Europe, in the centers of, of the world, Europe and America and so on. And but it's, it's, the, the problem with that is that it further um, sort of takes it away from the people in the continent. And so the people in Africa are, even, are becoming even more uh, distance from the art of the African people in the diasporas. And, you know, and, and being somebody who's at least partially um, diasporic from, from Africa, well, well, Yes. Um, how, how perhaps how can you relate this idea uh, that that yes, Britain and London is an imperial city. It is the center of art in, in, in many ways, and yes. African African artists want to be um, present here. And I, I mean, we all yes. love to be here. We have Christopher we have Shonibari, we have all these people from the, yes. the diaspora, African diasporas, and we love to to see them. The problem is that they are not seen at all in Africa. Yeah. And and. and and, and, and so, 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 what do you think about that idea that, that in fact, African art um, is not centered in Africa at all? Uh, so it's it's this kind of abstraction that Africa becomes even more of an abstraction. That African art, yes, we, we want to love it to see it here in, in in London and in Europe, and for us to be to fit in as, as black skin artists and you know that yeah. kind of thing with color to fit in. Yeah. Uh, I, what kind of relation can you pull to the? The art on the continent of Africa. Sorry, sorry. No, Don't exactly, I exactly, I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it always has, in one sense, what we're saying, it, it's that, you know, uh, people have always gone to one city, be it Rome or Athens, or, or, or it would have been Alexandria in, in Egyptian period, uh, then it's Paris or, or, or Munich or, or Berlin. It's always been places that artists have congregated in uh, where maybe there was more chance of being free in the sense that they could express their visions in a shared environment with other people that were taking risks like them. But yeah, I agree with you. Africa needs to have its own, um, it, it needs to have its, uh, it, it doesn't need to always go here to have it. I, I hope there are more rich Africans who want to make museums in Africa of African art and you build up your own, uh, uh, power power base in Africa, and you don't need to always be looking at uh, the West. But but it's a two way thing. Uh, in the, the 19th century, well, from about 1880, Western artists were looking at African art and being influenced by it. So you've got Cubism, you've got Gauguin, you've got, uh, yeah. and they're also looking at Japanese art. So, so yeah. you know, Van Gogh says he wants to be um, a, a Japanese artist in Arles. Uh, so, so it's only normal that uh, if, if Western white artists can appropriate African art, it's just, it's just as valid for African artists to appropriate white Western art. Uh, that's not a bad thing. As, as Picasso said, all the best artists yeah. don't borrow, they steal. You know? <laughs> you yeah. know? And I think it's very important, that, that concept. But uh, uh, you have such a rich heritage. You know, Af African artists... Uh, I, I still find it annoying when they had when Tate Modern opened, they had some 19th and early 20th century African sculptures, and they had Epstein on the plinth outside, and inside these ethnographical cases, they still put the African art as though it wasn't on equal footing. They still said we learned it, it was actually made about 10 years apart, but why not put the African art on a plinth? It's some of the greatest art ever made. So. Um, mm. You know, I mean, yeah. So, so, so yeah, but, but I think, yeah, you have to go back, to, you know, uh, when people like you, you're the future of African art because you go back or you go around the world and you keep promoting it and then you hopefully become a very rich artist and you go and build your museum in Africa and set grants for young African artists and things. Uh, I have a friend that is trying to do that in Mali. He's trying yeah. to set a museum up there. Uh, he's, he hasn't got much money, so... Uh, I, I donated quite a lot of books to this art school in Mali uh, because, yeah, you have to, uh, you know, Africa is such a rich continent. You know, it's got such a rich history. Uh, it, you know, why can't uh, why can't somewhere in Africa be the next Rome or the next London or the next New York or the next, you know, why can't you be in Africa next time? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know Rhonda is itching to come in. Can I just ask a short one? Maybe you, maybe that's okay. a short one. Um, you, concerning that very issue you talked about of spaces that are, are coming up, um, I mean, we are right now doing a, 
a public institution kind of you know event south yeah. southampton uh, city gallery and um university of southampton uh, which are both public you know the government funded uh, kind of it now Af africa has had um a challenge um since independence that the arts have not been very crucial in the nation building process and yes. and that means that right now in uganda not going to into history we just have two major um institutions they're very they're small institutions um yes. compared to uh, british ones like one is called 32 degrees east and they are actually trying to do exactly what you're talking about. They're trying to set up uh, a residence kind of space for artists or small libraries, trying to build a center. But it's private. It's not. There's no funding whatsoever from public or government. And then the other is Afri Art the Gallery, the, the one that I was part of uh, at, at, at 154. And the, the problem is that these are private and the private in individuals that have this desire to do something. And but how can you advise us? Maybe perhaps Rhonda can come in, or Larry Lynch can come in. How can you advise us? Like, who wants to sort of uh, get, like, imagine that kind of investment beyond the private? Because a private individual can only go so far. How right. can you help 32 degrees grow into a major museum? You know that to actually have a or host, you know, real major art collection. You know. Yeah, sorry, that's my last one. <laughs> no, it's, a hard, it's a very hard question to answer. I mean, I, I'm actually the wrong man in some ways because I'm not, uh, I'm very good at um, getting museum shows, uh, uh, but I don't have an agent. I don't have a big gallery behind me. I have myself and uh, uh, just a fearlessness. And I believe that I can make things happen, uh, you know, and I do. Uh, but it's not because the art world is saying, come into the door, Nahim, I will help you. It, yeah. when, have to uh i just believe with a force of personality you can be like the weather you can you can wake people up you know with with, with a lightning strike in a way yeah. and that's the way i am about life uh i, I would I know, i'd much rather easier for me but in africa it has to start with these small things and then when the world starts to clap and and people start to buy it uh, then the government start to say hey, hang on this is a great opportunity for tourism mm -hmm. for this and for that which it is. Uh, uh, art is culture is a great. Well, it's been it's been killed at the moment with COVID. But culture is is the only thing cultures have at the end. I mean, no one remembers generals. No one remembers politicians. Everyone yeah. remembers artists yeah. uh, because art, art, and and writers and musicians. Uh, that's that's in the end. You know, when you, the tourism is created around seeing beautiful old buildings and seeing what other cultures did. Uh, people aren't really interested in the battles or, you know, they're interested in the culture. And, and I think that's mm. the power of culture. Culture is what defines us as a human species as being civilized. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, civilization has come from art. Art is, is the most important thing in a way after the basics of survival, eating and, uh, you know, but and, and reproducing art is what brings out the individuality in all of us and you know that's why when any maybe you get dictatorship the first thing they want to suppress is artists because uh, yeah. they represent freedom uh, you know they represent an art re artist rep art is freedom in one sense mm -hmm. and yeah it's yeah i mean that's why i'm an artist thank god you know uh, thank, uh, you. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you sorry mm -hmm. it, yeah but you're the man. If you feel that passion, you're the man area to do it. And you know, you know, it's people like you that change the world. Ten guys in Paris, sitting in one cafe with Manet, ten painters and a few women painters as well, uh, Casa and Morisot, and Eva Gonzalez. Uh, about ten or twelve of them changed the Western world, the art world for good. It never looked went backwards. It always went forwards from there. It doesn't take Thousand okay. to make a revolution happen. Yeah, no, thank you. I, okay, I, I'll let Rhonda ask. Uh, maybe it's a more time I can ask uh, more specific questions to your to your to your practice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, area. Honestly, um, I think um, you're going to have to uh, do do some really fabulous work now and uh, really steer this forward. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, I think Nahim's really right. I mean, it's, that it's a really, really difficult question to answer, and I certainly cannot answer that. But, but what I can say is that um, 
you know, even, uh, you know, publicly funded arts organisations in this country have taken quite some time to come about. And uh, we are kind of slowly, even now, getting towards a shift of uh, the kind of old privileged aspect of uh, art museums and art galleries and working towards uh, art that is for everyone. And I think that that's really, really important and art that really represents uh, a wider society rather than ourselves. And so I guess that kind of leads me to my question for you, Nahem, in, with regards to art history. So this is one of the things that I'm particularly interested in as well in terms of uh, social justice and representation, cultural representation in our art uh, and practice. And it's something that you um, really, really pick up on, I think, within your artwork and also some of the interviews that I've seen you in uh, with regards to art history and how that um, really kind of hides uh, some narratives within uh, the history itself? Uh, very much so. I mean, even in this exhibition, Base of Britain, I brought two artists into this exhibition, L Louise Cortnello, one of the greatest self-portrait artists I've ever come across in the history of art. She's absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, uh, but she's, she's right now when there's so much attention onto women artists, I find it almost a disgrace that someone like her isn't more well known. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she's almost 58. She's, she's done something almost such a naked gaze in a kind of between a kind of Vermeer meets Lucy and Freud in quality, stillness of Vermeer and the scrutiny of Freud in a way. She's done something such, which I've never seen before. I mean, Artemisa is doing it, but she, but that took 400 years to rediscover Artemisa. I hope we don't do that with Louise Courtenelle. You know, I hope we don't spend another 400 years realizing that we had this kind of very unusual artist. I mean, you know, uh, going back to Larry Lynch's question, I mean, about portraiture, being subversive. Yes, she, she paints from life in front of a mirror, self-portrait, could be the most ordinary, like traditional thing. But the intensity, the way she does it, the kind of the human presence, the nakedness of these portraits, uh, elevate them to the most contemporary kind of vision of art. And uh, yeah, so she was one of the people I've been very, forcefully wanting to kind of put into this exhibition because women artists have been neglected very, very strongly. And then Desmond Horton has two incredible paintings called Sleeper One and Sleeper Two in this exhibition. I, I placed Desmond's painting next to Van Dyck for a very intentional reason. One, I think he's one of the greatest British painters, full stop. Um, incredible power, has a kind of grandness to his painting. And also because it's never happened before, as far as I know, this is like a Duchamp ready-made. I mean, I'm putting in something, I'm putting a subversive thing. A black artist, as far as I know, in the history of art, there have been some very, very important ones, have never had their work next to one of the greatest portrait painters of all time, uh, because they just would never have been allowed. It would have just never happened. It wouldn't have happened in the 90s. You know, even two, I mean, I, you know, uh, those paintings were painted in 1997 and 98, and, they were never exhibited because they were rejected from things and they were never exhibited and they were probably some of the best paintings being painted at the time. And it's taken to this exhibition in 2020 for these paintings to be seen. And I've, yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, like I said, I, I feel like there's, that's a conceptual twist, a political twist. I said this exhibition's political for that reason. I'm doing yeah. things that seem like they're nothing, but it's one of the most uh, unusual steps I've seen in an exhibition. I've not gone to an exhibition where it's two people have been put into an exhibition that have been underrepresented, not just the talk. It's always like the big names generally are getting put into the same exhibitions again and again, and very little risk is being taken where someone goes out on a limb and says, I think these two artists, well, I would have liked more, but uh, it couldn't have been more in this situation. I had a, I, I, the Southampton Art Gallery, I had to work with their collection and, and, uh, I managed to get hold of the Sonia boy from a friend of mine that owns that painting. I wanted to put an emphasis on Gwen Johns, uh, Sonia Boyce and Louise Cornell to bring out women artists uh, and to bring out black artists and colors of, painters of color like myself uh, yeah. to, to, to put a new spotlight on this kind of tired medium of portraiture, to, to give it new wings in a sense. Uh, and sorry, and yeah. And, but it goes across the spectrum, that, that thing. 
in, in the history of art, uh, uh, you know, uh, the LGBT community, they've had they've had incredibly difficult time. Uh, well, they've been killed for it. They've been, you know, in different periods. Uh, there's so many things that need to be readdressed in the art world right now. And, but this is one of the first times that people are listening and, and they're feeling that they're feeling they have to make change. It's partly forced on them by the, by the government. Uh, it's become part of the remit of every art gallery. They have to promote diversity for good. You know, uh, our art galleries have to remain fresh things. Uh, a, a museum can be just a, a room full of, of, of dusty objects, or it can be objects that inspire and are thought provoking and, and wake people up, you know, you know, like one of those Cinderella or stories where a thousand years and you get woken up by a kiss, a great art object or work of art is like being woken up with a beautiful kiss of art, you know, and that's why I think it's, um, for me, every time I do an exhibition, it has to have a very political edge to it. It's not just good pictures, it has to be more than just good paintings. Uh, yeah. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Yes, and um, uh, just just one more, if I may. Um, yes. Um, it, I kind of get the impression that um, from from much of what you said, um, you've kind of done it in spite of, and I think that yeah. you know that is really something that you know we need to you know really really think about and how we um, communicate that to younger people so uh, this is more of a i guess a question in terms of um, engagement if you like so um what would you say in terms of um young people that may be uh, visiting or engaging this exhibition and um any kind of hopes and aspirations for the future in terms of representation um of people of color well, I hope more people go. I think I really hope that it gets uh, more people of color going to this exhibition and, and making them feel that they can, they have just as much right to be in the art gallery and hopefully inspire them to become artists or, mm -hmm. or anything. And I, I'm just art, right? I'm a painter. Uh, but if it inspires them to become a, a mountain climber, if, uh, to be a, a, a hang glider, to be anything, but makes them believe in their dreams, whatever they want to do, uh, and nothing will hold them back. I think you know, uh, life is uh, life is tough. It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it's but it's also so delicious and rich and exciting and knowing, getting to know yourself over a tough life and trying to keep yourself warm and your spirit optimistic uh, is just a beautiful thing. It's 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 like one of the best cocktails. You, of yourself that you shake, you shake up and you drink and you think, wow, I'm so glad to be alive right now. And uh, this time of COVID, you know, uh, it's amazing how people immediately started doing something creative today. It didn't matter if it was good or bad, but everyone was drawing, everyone was suddenly making art, everyone was doing things, preparing clothes, making clothes, fantastic. Uh, there was a sense of spring coming up, the birds singing, the flowers and the leaves coming. and the whole world felt like it was having its springtime in a sense at that moment. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, it's also a tragedy. I mean, it's like I said, bittersweet. Life is challenging. I mean, people are going to lose their jobs. It's a terrible time yeah. as well. I mean, it's a very tough time and many people are dying. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to brush over the reality of life. I'm just saying uh, the only way we overcome challenges is to be as free and as creative and follow our hearts because you can't fail. Failure is not failure. Uh, failure yeah. is to try and failure is to take risks. And you never, ever regret in long term any decision you make in the long term. You always feel that it was better to, have, to try and not to try things. Um, and then you get older, you know, I mean, I'm so, I mean, you know, I'm so used to, to things not happening, but it just, they're like dandruff on my shoulders. You know, I just flick them off and it's gone, you know, and I think, okay, that didn't quite work. We'll find another way in because um, I will not be silenced. You know, no one's going to silence me anymore. You know, that's, you know, I just will keep knocking. As Constable said, a very good quote, he said, because he was very successful, really. Only his friends bought his work. He said, I kept, I kept, I realized that I kept banging away 
eventually I'd get stuck in. And I see the same thing about me and anyone else. And Aria has got to do the same thing. And uh, but I, I believe that we can change the world. I, I do believe that. You know, you have to believe it. Uh, you know. And, I'm 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 dying to ask another question. Just maybe please allow me, Larry and, and Rhonda. <laughs> yeah, um, but specific to your practice, um, I might I may have read it wrong, but there's some colors you don't use. Do you say you don't use a black paint? Um, yeah, yeah, I may I be wrong. Then, um, it's sort of like um, is there a particular reason for that? And then the other one is Benga. I, I think the character of Benga in those massive yeah. portraits is yeah, very yeah. very for me and very um it's in some way not haunting but it's that it, it's so present in the work it's so central it's so dominant in in this yeah. um is, is that a particular reason for that is it um what, what, what's what's the message the Be okay. particular benga as, as a sitter because there's so many paintings that where, where benga appears the color the choice of color why is black missing from, from the palette what. Okay, I'll tell you why I did it. Uh, it's partly political. I mean, partly because I uh, was very influenced by people like Suzanne and Monet. I, I took their palette. Uh, I wanted to get, you know how Monet uh, looked at things like uh, yeah. Haystack or, or something, yeah. or cathedral, like no one else. Yeah. And I felt that portraiture often people fall into cliches. So, uh, and when you look at the history of the black image in portraiture, hardly any of them have got names to those portraits. If you yeah. go into the 18th century, they're all portrait of a, an, a, a man or portrait of, of an African or, mm. you know, mm. uh, just these, uh, uh, or possibly of, or possibly of. Uh, just, and, and so I felt that for me, uh, there's a quote that Coro and both Cezanne make, which is, I want to paint the world as I was a newborn child. Well, mm -hmm. I wanted to paint all my mixed and black friends with no preconceived ideas that uh, black is using brown, black is using brown or umbers yes. or, or or I want you to paint it uh, as it really was each individual yeah. now, by by having a black and a brown and number in my palette it would limit the kind of colors I could see uh, it would it would darken things in a certain way that would always be predictable. So, because I wanted to be um, amazed by each person, and and the way I paint people, I always talked, and they went for a long, long time because it wasn't like I just painted them in one day. I, I actually spent uh, six months to a year, and the reason for that was it wasn't because I couldn't have done it in three days. I could have done something quite comp competent in three days. Was because I wanted it to be a journey. Each time I entered the studio, I had this philosophy that I to paint uh, every mark had to be about discovery and i wanted to discover something new each time uh, mm. so after six months i would still be discovering something new and the very last mark had to be about discovery mm. so the palette i used is to try and surprise myself i didn't want to finish things off i wanted things to be endless in a way and then the final day where i felt i saw something new I paint it. And so for me, the palette was about individuality because because of those racist stereotypes about black people, I wanted it to be to put so much of the individual into each portrait. And you, you say about Benga, well, Benga uh, is a brother, I mean, kind of friend to me, beyond friend, you know, we've traveled together. I, I, he's a student of mine for 10 years. He, he did go to art school, but I was teaching him certain crafting and it wasn't he wasn't paying me. I was teaching him for free for 10 years. And he was sitting for me many, many times. Uh, so we were discussing art. So he would enjoy the process of seeing me paint him more and more profoundly. And he, uh, I painted him 22 times in the end. And yeah, I tried to deal with things that were going on. That the painting of the back of his head, I thought, although Magritte had done that and Vermeer, I wanted to paint the back of a black man's head uh, to almost paint his brain, to paint his mind because of those stereotypes about mm. black people being savages and all these kind of racist stereotypes, to completely mm. go against that. Uh, there's a very big one of Ben in the first room. He's almost in Rodin, the thinker's kind of pose because it was the beginning of a new uh, millennium. And I thought the, 
you know, we have an example where Nelson Mandela as the kind of seen as the greatest man of the end of the 20th century. But I wanted the, the, the thinker, the Rodin thinker of the 21st century to be a black man, uh, yeah. not to be this stereotype, all oh, black men are aggressive and all these crap things. Uh, hence, I paint him in, in, the, in the arm pose, to have this bent or very muscular body, but the, the mood is so gentle and soft to completely counteract yeah. these kind of stereotypes. The, the paintings of Ben are very profound to me. You know, uh, uh, in that process, we talked all the time, and in that process, yeah, we became very, very deep friends. And he's a yeah. very good painter in his own right. I'm, I'm trying to actually organize an exhibition with myself, him, and, and Desmond Horton, who's also in this exhibition uh, yeah. called Out of the Shadows Into yeah. the Light. Uh, we'll we'll well. see if we, at, uh, but yeah, so yeah. But he, but he, but he, but he, yeah, those paintings are very special because he enjoyed yeah. it as much as me, you know. And he discovered, yeah. he discovered Desmond because he, he was a, he was a security guard in the National Gallery. And then he went to the Tate Gallery. Oh. And, and Desmond Horton had won prize in the BP Portrait Awards. And he went up to Desmond Horton and he said, Excuse me, are you Desmond Horton? I love your painting in, in the style of Velasquez. And then, can I come to your studio? And when he went to the studio, it was the day I was turning up, and we both did, Desmond did a painting, and I drew Ben. And that mm -hmm. was in, in March uh, 1997, and then I, I, I stopped painting him in, in 2007, and then, but we still remain friends, and to this day, we're, we're very close friends, like brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I think um, while the panel may still want to ask some questions, perhaps we can open the floor to questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please, can you type them on the chat so we're able to see them? Um, I'm sure that you have questions. And, um, sorry if my voice goes sometimes. It's just I've got this iPad and I can't do anything about it. Uh, I don't have a, an external microphone. We can hear you. OK, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to step out again uh, so you can keep talking and uh, I'll uh, I'll read the questions as they come through. All right, brilliant. Uh, uh, shall I ask why, why we're waiting for a question? Uh, yeah. Nahim, are you still painting now? I am. Um, you know, I do very different kind of work. I mean, I, uh, from 2010, uh, I, I uh, well, I've always, well, I did some very strange work for about three years. Uh, I've, I've always resisted working from photography and from Photoshop, but but I felt like I had to uh, confront my demon in a way, and um, I had to embrace it. It was like a way of releasing myself away from portraiture and working from life in that way. So I had to make that work, which is, and then I went to what, which is my other love, is working from my imagination, uh, but combining it, I said, with drawings. Uh, Sometimes using figures from fashion magazines or, or, or photographing shop dummies in, in, in uh, shop windows. So I've got my, and then putting imaginary people, uh, often black or mixed race people, in the poses from my head. But they're wearing the latest clothing. I quite like the idea that they, that you could date the painting by the clothes they're wearing. Uh, but they're imaginary paintings inspired by a bit like, hence why I've got Joy and Ophelia in this show. Hence, uh, me yeah. and Doig and Ophelia have been inspired by very similar artists. Uh, the 20th century was really shadowed by Matisse and Picasso. Uh, I think uh, in I think Kandinsky said that Picasso formed Matisse color, uh, and those fat sausage fingers went right up until the 80s with the Glasgow boys. Those sausage hands of Picasso's were still there in the art. Everyone drew like Picasso, from Patrick Heron to I mean it was stars, but there was another kind of modernism that came from Gauguin and the Narvis, mm. and it had Guillard and Bonnard, yeah. and uh, Munch, another artist who was very influential. That really affected people like Doig, myself, and many, many kind of uh, Daniel Richter and other kind of modernist artists. And it's that take on modernism that really inspired me. Uh, Van Gogh, I'd include in that list. Um, and I feel there's a kind of a new kind of narrative painting that can be done. Uh, it's otherworldly. It's, uh, it's yeah, it, it can be set in London, but I'm still trying to create a kind of, I mean, I have, I have, I have a house in Spain and I, the Spanish mountains, and I, 
all the walks and all the paintings I've done there in the past and the tree drawings I've done there now of all ancient olive trees, they all intermingle into this, I call it London, but really it's, it's walking into my uh, London of my imagination, but it has a bit of Spain. And I suppose there's a kind of new place painting is going. In a way, it's a kind of, um, I kind of say, it's like trying to find Gauguin, but in your own personal paradise of where you're living. Uh, I think that's where painting is going. And, and I feel like I've been doing that for about 10 years now. <clears throat> and they're very big paintings. They're five or meters long, four meters. Um, I want them to be like the size of landscapes, in a way. I want to be able to, be able to walk through them, but they don't have, in a way, all the, the technical stuff I know from my kind of classical training is, is there to be bashed on the head. You know, I'm, I'm getting a big club and I'm smashing my, I'm not trying to make my figures realistic. I'm trying to make them like a lot of modernism, uh, a mixture between realism and flatness and abstraction and things that are not things that look like things. Um, because I feel that's where painting is going. I mean, that's, uh, people have always said that painting is dead. And that's beautiful for painting, because painting is like a garden. Every time you get a season, you get your springtime, you get your winter. Every time I see people say that to me, I think, wait till the next spring and tell me if painting is dead. You know, painting will never die. You know, yeah. it, it's, um, you go to those 100,000 you know, years ago and you see, someone hand on a, on a cable, someone has spat onto that hand and created a handprint. <laughs> and it, and it, it could have been signed Rembrandt because it's the first self portrait ever made. Um, and we are just moved by it because it says, like Descartes, I think therefore I am, you know, it's a very powerful thing. Uh, I have uh, this thing where I want to express my vision of my life and for, for religious reasons or ritualistic, but yeah, I take my hat off to those guys and say, hello, fellow artists. I want to shake your hand through time. You know, we're very lucky to be artists. Yeah. We have a question, Nahem. Um, oh, yeah. there is a question on the chat from Sunil. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in the preparation of the artwork. Nahem, can you perhaps say something about how you lead into a new work? and how you begin your work before the canvas and the sitter. Right. And then there is a supplementary question to this. Um, how you complete the work, when is it, when is it finished? Sartre suggests that, suggests that, painter, uh, that the painter can never finish the painting. They always see it as in progress. Uh, I mean, in one sense, it, it's true. Uh, painting never finishes in one sense, uh, but there was a point uh, in, in a long painting where uh, there's a point where you know if you do another brush stroke, you know that you're going to start another vision. It's actually going out of the vision of that painting. So for me, that's the time to stop before you put that last brush stroke on. Uh, there's a very famous uh, book by Vollard of Sitting for Cezanne, and he sees these three white dots onto the uh, onto the portrait and he says uh, why don't you paint those dots in and, and, and Suzanne says uh, if I was to paint them in just randomly I'd have to uh, start a new painting it would become another painting and then he said I've got to go to the Louvre and maybe after my studies of drawing the Louvre I'd come back and be able to finish it it never was finished but what with my pro process with the, with the model uh, when I was painting people it was uh, I would prime my canvas with a color kind of grayish kind of color uh, with acrylic uh, to have a kind of neutral ground to start with. Um, and I wouldn't draw anything out. I'd just do it by shape, uh, uh, shape and color and tone all together at the same time. I would um, try and get cover it, big brushes, very large brushes, the very beginning uh, of the painting, and try and have the whole canvas, even if it's a six foot canvas, done in the first day in the first session, maybe a four hour session. Uh, and then I would slowly correct myself and try and refine things and uh, just keep looking and keep talking to the person. Uh, I wouldn't start, if someone came to sit with me who I didn't know, I would spend the first hour of a cup of tea talking to them and seeing if they fell into any natural kind of poses. 
that they repeated and repeated a certain kind of pose. And I say, okay, you sit like that because you, you, you seem to do that many times. Uh, and then I would just talk to them. Uh, with the giant heads, it was, um, I had to do some on, on the drawing just to get them to scale into the canvas because I got quite clever at, at placing a chin at like one centimeter from the bottom or one centimeter from the top. So I had to be pretty sure that the drawing was quite accurate, but it's quite broad drawing. People say drawing is more about just the general proportions. And I still have the whole canvas covered by the second session. Uh, but then I would spend another like 30 or 40 sessions on these paintings uh, because I wanted to surprise myself. I, I'm not really interested in realism, although they look very realistic, these paintings. A lot of people say to me when they come up to those paintings, they're very abstract, close up, they're just marked. Uh, it's that balance I was trying to get. Close up, I was thinking about even people like William de Kooning and certain abstract expressionists, especially with the very big giant head of Ben. I, I wanted the paint to go as wild as possible, but for every brushstroke to be about an idea that I was seeing, something I was actually seeing and relating to something else. Uh, so it had to be about investigation. So no matter how wild the mark was made, it had to be about something I'd seen, not thought. Uh, because it's very easy when you use thick paint to become slick. And I don't know if people know the word, what it means nowadays. But basically, when it becomes just too facile or superficial, the mark looks very juicy and delicious. But if someone says, why did you put it there? You could only answer because it looked nice. You didn't have to have a reason for putting it there. I wanted to say because that blue, the pink color had to be there for me. I mean, this is not right for everyone, but I didn't, I wanted the painting to feel authentic because I'm trying to paint someone in front of me. I'm trying to paint the impossible thing to try and capture someone's essence and someone's everything about them. And it, I, I'm not really keen on, I don't like portrait commission type portraits. I, I like paintings that are about art in a way. They're just as much paintings as they are about what someone looks like. And hopefully, if you're lucky, a bit of the human condition uh, creeps into the brush strokes and you manage to put that onto the canvas. Because in the end, we're trying to paint the human condition, really, when we paint someone. Uh, but yeah, that's how I did it. But yeah, so I would start with uh, a gray big broad brushes, put in the big general tones, and then decide to work on an area like, you know, I'd work on about eight areas. I would actually tell myself, oh, I'm gonna work on the nose today. And I'd spend the whole day working on the cheeks, the mouth, the forehead, the I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work on the nose, I'm gonna work on the nose. And, and maybe I did two brush strokes on the nose after six hours of painting someone because, you know, it's 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 there's, there's not a uh, your, your it's instinctive painting you know you 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 try and uh, intellectualize it but in the end it's uh, I intellectualize I mean I I'm very much conscious when I do a project that it's got an intellectual theme mm -hmm. I said I'm very political about my portraits uh, and and then you know uh, when I painted people because I couldn't afford I never had a studio that's one thing to remember when you see these big paintings in this big museum. Uh, I was painting in my one bedroom flat, but literally was not making enough money as an artist. Uh, I was getting rejected from a lot of the big portrait competitions, and so these paintings were not being seen. But I managed to convince about 15 people to sit for me. Every week they would come. I'd have two or three a day, uh, and they'd recognize each other in the street. Oh, you're going to post for Nahim. I've seen the painting of you. And they'd come in, and they did it for free, uh, and they had to like it. You know, they sat for four or five hours at a time. You have to really like that thing to do. They'd come on the very last, after one year of painting, on the very last session, they would say to me, so when are we going to start the next one? And then we, I said, let's come on, come on Wednesday. I said, shit, Wednesday's four days away. I better get a canvas together. I better get, you know, what am I going to paint? You know, and it was just, we just come up with an idea. And then we said, oh, there's the profile of Gabenga in this exhibition. Well, he's looking at, be looking at another person called Kiki. There's one, I did another one of Tiffany looking in at a guy called Fergus. They had their mouths slightly open, so they were like talking to each other. That was the aim. The little themes would suddenly emerge. But uh, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was a privilege. In my one bedroom flat, I filled even bigger spaces than this. I made 40 paintings, 28 giant heads uh, from life. 
it, it, in a way, that's the story of the painting. I mean, in a way, I, I could have said, oh, I can't do them because I don't have a studio. But I went yeah. down to the hardware shop and bought a seven foot piece of lino that I rolled up in the corner of the room. That became my studio, my magic carpet, I called it. It became my magic carpet, where, and it worked. But for, for, for eight years, I did it. From, from 1998, nine, I started working to, to 2007, the last painting. 2008 was the very last one. And uh, I couldn't do it again, though. You know, I couldn't go back to it. It took so much willpower to make people sit for, for years. You know, it's kind of it had to be in a certain state of mind, too, because, you know, it was like a one off thing in my life because I loved it, loved every minute of it. But, you know, everyone, if you're painting someone, a woman, they've got to have to have their periods, they have all these things. And you have and it's trust that part of the intimacy of it. Someone said, you don't mind if I, if I wear my knickers today or this is fine to me or I'm going to cry all session. That's fine. I mean, that's because they're my friends. I mean, that, I want to get that across. These people were my friends. It wasn't painting, paying a model. I was painting my friends of all their emotions, and I loved being in their company, happy or sad. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it was a privileged uh, period of my life, ten-year period. That, uh, in, in a way, that's why I can keep showing that work because the work somehow is fresh still. It hasn't. It's actually. I think it's better now, like a good wine. It's become so much more polit political now because. Uh, when I was showing people that work when it was being painted, practically every museum in the country uh, turned it down. Uh, you know, I wasn't interested in race at the moment. Race is not a theme. You know, uh, mm. I even had top contemporary artists, so I won't mention names, but they've said to me, Nahim, who cares about race? You know, you're completely not on the contemporary art dialogue, Nahim, making this work. You know, uh, what you're doing is completely wrong. Uh, and, but, you know, History's proved me right. And it's quite a nice feeling to have it in your stomach that you were not crazy. This was a powerful body of work. Uh, it was real. It was like one of those real things in your life. I never regret it, ever, what I did. It's, it, I feel privileged to have done this with my friends. And we all did it because we knew that the theme was so relevant and so uh, uh, different, you know, to the kind of stereotyped images in art galleries. Or, yeah. you know, even the great modernist classic, Manny's Olympia, is just in the same stereotype as those Peter Lilly and all these kind of Van Dyke portraits of the page boy handing the white woman flowers. What changed? Manny's image is quite racist, if I'm being honest. Uh, never, went, never heard one art historian actually bring that up. They, they always talk about the fact that she's a prostitute and all this, or, or referencing that idea of not being the, the classical Venus. But no one brings that point up that the black woman is still following uh, a, a stereotype uh, of, of, of aristocracy, of the, the black slave or the black servant being, you know, giving the flowers to the, the rich white woman. And uh, although a few years later, it was, um, what do you call him again? The other, uh, Basile made these two very honest portraits of um, just a normal Parisian bl uh, flower seller. But it was nothing, that was a real honest snapshot of life uh, on, uh, in one of the few really honest images of black people in the 19th century. So, but, but I probably Manny's world didn't mix in that way. You know, anyway, I'm, I'm diverting to the point, but I'm saying that that's one of the great things that I, when I say history of art, not one art historian ever brought that point up. You know, it is an important point. You know, so anyway, uh, I'm always thinking about the physical aspect of painting and what painting means. It's, it's a big dialogue right now uh, in art. Uh, so, so there are a couple of follow-ups uh, to, to this question. Uh, one about process from Lucy, and she wonders whether you can tell us a little bit more about your tutor's uh, process of making portraits and now how that affected uh, or informed yours. Well, well, well he, he, he devised a very clever process of teaching uh, art. Uh, race, I mean, it was, it was um, he called it the, the, the tone of the tone, the shape of the shape, and the color of the color. And it's about, and basically what, we started off doing still life objects, uh, milk bottles, 
toilet roll uh, packets and things uh, and wine bottles painted black or white, first of all. And we would have a palette uh, of black and white emulsion paint. Um, and we just had to have no, no preliminary drawing, but we had to work out what was the darkest thing on, on, on the canvas and what was the lightest thing in our minds, conceptually. We had to grade it in our mind, what was, before we even put a paintbrush down, knowing that we couldn't go, we were given black boards as well, black uh, boards painted with black emulsion. So we knew we couldn't go darker than our black boards and we knew we couldn't go lighter than a white paint. So we had to keep it slightly above, uh, slightly below the dark the black and slightly below the white. So you had to add a tiny bit of black into the white to get a light color. And then we had to grade it without preliminary drawing. So we start with the background. By putting the background, say, wall behind the still life object, we had all the shapes of the object painted in without drawing them. And then we would uh, put the biggest areas of tone in first. And then we would, uh, in 20 minutes, would have this quite realistic, a bit like Georgia Morandi kind of still life. Uh, and then he would start doing that with color objects, the same thing, a, a, a cadmium red a box, a viridian green box. And, and then we would have to paint the color objects in black and white. So we'd have to try and mix the color of yellow or the color of red. Now, a red can be very bright, like cadmium red, but tonally, it looks as bright as a cadmium yellow, but tonally the red is a very dark tone and the cadmium yellow is a very light tone. So we had to learn how to mix those things tonally. It's quite challenging to actually know how to mix uh, and why Viridian Green is even darker color. Or It was like a kind of way of, you know, and then we started to paint color objects with color palettes, uh, uh, all with emulsion paint, though. It, it, he always like, he never let us keep these, these things as we always was like, would almost like paint over them immediately. So we could never start thinking we were making art. It was very much about we were there to learn something and see it together as a whole. The right reason why you calculated all the different tones to see it as a whole. It's a very good principle because it's really what more or less from Manet to Picasso to Monet to Degas to uh, Modigliani to Chagall to most painters. They were taught this method or a version of it from the 19th century, uh, yeah. a tonal method. But without that kind of academic thing that you'd get in a kind of Florence school now, or it, it didn't produce the kind of sterile neoclassical kind of dullness that I can't stand. Uh, um, it's kind of, uh, Delacroix described it as perfection of the art of boring. <laughs> and that's how I see it. I do see it as perfection of the art of boring. Uh, you know, I think uh, you can look at something, say like Paul Arego or Lucian Freud and it can be very well observed uh, and very powerful and very, but there's nothing boring about it. it you, feel, you feel like they're pinning down humanity in the brushstrokes, both of them. You feel like it's real life here, you know. Uh, you might find Freud's gaze, the male gaze, a very cruel one, uh, like a piece of meat on it, but it's, uh, but you know, these are people that lived through the Second World War. They saw the most horrific things about brutality of mankind. I mean, they were shaped by it. Uh, that existential look at humanity that Francis Bacon and Freud and Arbuck, to be someone like Arbuck or Kossoff or Freud and know that uh, when you were in your 20s, half the Jewish race were killed. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that they are trying to do that Pygmalion thing. And when Freud said, I want the paint to become flesh or Arbuck is like so determined to, 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 to try and make a new species, he describes it as. Uh, there was a reason for that kind of intensity. So it's not a, a, a friendly one, it's not a soft one. But and Paula Rego had that kind of quality in her work. It, it's, it's, the, um, it's to me, it's one of the only valid kind of portraiture in a way today. It, it's um, because it, it didn't, never stopped not addressing ideas of modernism, you know. So when you hear Arbuck talk, he's talking about de Kooning, he's talking about, you know, Soutine and all these influences. Um, but like Rembrandt, uh, who said his one fame, one known quote was, uh, let nature be your, your teacher and no other rules, you know. Uh, yeah. And they always were bent back to looking, you know. And looking is, you can never go wrong if, if you do it honestly and do it with a vision. 
just imagine, say to everyone here, um, the Thames, you know, we all know this river in London and many artists have painted it, you know, uh, from Monet to Turner, to Constable, to uh, Kokoschka, um, and, you know, uh, uh, Deran. I mean, there's been uh, a million artists that have painted it, Whistler, and they all say they're painting truth. They're all there going, I painted the Thames. And you get seven completely different stairs, different visions of one place that they all think that they're, 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 they're saying the truth. That's the beauty that, that, you know, that's the beauty of art. As Degas said, art is the lie where you tell the truth, you know, and I believe that, you know, and, and that's what vision is. And I, I don't care. I mean, my approach is just how I was taught. I'm not saying it's right for everyone. Uh, so, someone like Doig acknowledges that he has very little technical drawing skill or, and he's managed to make the most deep, profound art. I think some of the best in a way, technical paintings I've seen as well as being ready to be moving. So there isn't one approach. I like to say all roads lead to Rome, you know, which have to be done with vision and risk. If you're not taking risks, then you're doing something wrong. Risk is a very, very important element. As Francis Bacon said, an artist that doesn't take risks become, becomes an RA. Uh, and, is, and, you know, and, and there's some very good RAs, I mean, I'm only joking, but you have to take risks. Yeah. yeah. So there is a follow-up question from Sunil, um, which puts Ed Area under the spotlight. Yeah. Um, oh. Area, do you want to add something about process? How how you feel you know you relate to painting, yeah. and how you feel here with Naim's approach? Yeah, um, it's <laughs> thank you, Sunil. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I, I haven't had a sitter uh, for me until quite recently, and. Even that sitter was, I, I really struggled. It was two times. Um, so, so here you're saying that you, 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 you're sitting for 40 times one painting. I was like, oh, wow, that's, that commitment is something that I don't think I, I, I may have, uh, I may be able to convince somebody to sit, to sit for me 40 times. But to answer part of the next question, um, my, my, I'm, well, I've been here for four years, and I, I, I came out of illustration, maybe drawing and painting uh, in something that I would call ab abstract African abstraction, af African expression, African af then an F Afro kind of sort of approaching a, a subject, and and my work is also political, and, and um, yeah, so I, I I like to I like to look at not sitters. Leaving people that who are next to me, my, you know, like you are doing, Naim. I was yeah. sort of cutting up. I was just look, looking at magazines and and newspapers and listening to the news. You know, Brexit or or Trump or things like that. Or you know, what have always been interesting for me. So in between being a, an illustrator and a, a drawing, um, collage came came into that as well. I, I did a lot of collage. So I, Loads and lots of collage stuff. So, in my practice, the, the last four years I've been here has been mostly about collage, just bringing historical characters. Because I was I I was doing work on um, on identity. So it's generally about identity, and and in in more specific terms, I was looking at myself as a black man in 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 a white space. You know, basically as an outsider. So. So I was trying to, at first I was, I was very anxious. So a lot of my work was very frantic and, and nervous and, you know, just, you know, being worried about just making stuff until you, the, the nervousness would go away. So I was tearing, I was doing a lot of work with the, with the collages, the magazines, and I was doing a lot of tearing, the newspapers. And this is the time when we were hearing stuff about migrants and Britain full of migrants and uh, the, the hostile environment, you know, stuff like that. And, and Theresa May talking about um, citizens of nowhere. So these things were very, yeah, they were quite make, making me very nervous as, as, as an artist. Yes, but, I, but then um, it was inspiring me to work. So, so I was just basically trying to do what you're doing, except I wasn't. Um, and I actually, 
I, I had the same problem as you. I, I did not have a studio. So I had to do a lot of this staring up of stuff and collaging and putting layers and layers of glued pieces of paper in my own room, you know, my, you know, my own, you know, room. So I did a, I did a lot of stuff. Some of them was, was quite big, but it was just growing and growing in my space, in, in my room, you know. So, so because of the, the studio thing was an issue for me, I, I quickly moved away from canvas. <laughs> I quickly, quickly moved away from the canvas. And, uh, you know, like the big, I, I can't imagine that those big paintings of, of, of Benga were, <laughs> were in a one room flat, you know? you know? It's actually quite hard to imagine that. Yeah, so I, I moved and into the paper and, and just stuck with the paper because I could fold up the paper. I could yeah. just put it in a suitcase. I could, if I, if I got fed up of it, I could do stuff to it and still come back to it and still have it as as, as material. And, yeah, so I don't know if I'm answering Sunil's question, but <laughs> uh, just trying to, you know, just brought back a lot of stuff. But and then at the end of my my practice, I did a lot of stuff with cardboard. Um, during the lockdown, I did stuff with um, cardboard, and I just feel like I want to run and get get a, get a piece of that. But I was doing a lot of stuff with cardboard, um, making this nowhere space because we were all all of a sudden all caught up in utopia. And yeah, and we were just you know waiting to get to go at the airport, you know, waiting at an airport endlessly. Like we all became refugees, you know, or, or prisoners in our home. So I did a project with cardboards and stuff, and then lately I'm easing myself back into painting again. Um, the work at um, at 54 at um, the, the Contemporary Art uh, Fest, uh, whatever you know, fair in London. It's sort of tapping, trying to actually, it's, it's very coincidence because I'm, I'm now trying to do portraits. And these portraits um, are trying to respond to this image, this imagery of, of, of people like Francis Galton and Charles Darwin, you know, people I did not, people that were sort of, I had this negative reaction to, you know, as people that I sort of um, explain a bit of why this, the absent positive black image. Why were well, there's a black, you know, because these people are teaching stuff on evolution, teaching stuff on eugenics and all these kind of things. Okay. And I just thought that this imagination of of this uh, this black this black people as you know as as negatives, as shadows, as evil, in, inherently evil, and I just thought that those things were being taught as as theology, you know, scientific kind of, you know, in a it actually quite dogmatic way in theology through people like Franz um, Charles Darwin. So. The paintings I'm making now are sort of responding to that and saying, okay, you need to move away from the, that toxicity and negativity and you start to paint something that you find more, you know, more, more calming. So again, I'm not using sitters. I'm just going to the, going to computer and uh, looking up images, you know, of people or, and then just trying to collage them together quite literally, you know, through, by painting. But I'm just getting one hand from here a piece of cloth from Elizabeth the First. I, I love Elizabeth the First attire. I love her attire. I'm, I'm probably James the Fifth. I just love the little things, you know, the the, the rigo, you know. And then I just put it on these black people, you know, maybe um, Paul Paul Gilroy or or Tracy Chapman or you know uh, characters that I, I think are positive black faces, you know. So that's what, uh, in a nutshell, that's that's my answer. <laughs> very well answered. Yeah, I thought. it was very well. Answered. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, actually, um, I have a really good um, follow-up question around this idea or this relationship for both Niam and the whole panel hmm. around this relationship between art and painting and politics. Um, the question is from Joe. It is. Um, I wonder if the panel could comment on the relevance of painting in the contemporary world in the light of recent government adverts for retraining and a general disregard for the arts per se. Yeah, I've seen the adverts, it's pretty bad. I mean, uh, I think everyone wants to retrain and become artists myself, but uh, the opposite, uh, um, yeah, I mean, look, governments have never, I mean, uh, valued the arts. It's always, um, it's only because it's become such good tourism. Uh, ironically, you know, uh, as air, as air tickets have become cheaper and 
people have been able to travel around the we are literally destroying the planet i mean for this hunger to to see culture or or from from all types of art from music to painting so it's uh you have to fight for it i mean you know i just think art is something is is uh most, one of the most important things but i think it's it always needs to be fought for it can't just be you can't you can't leave it to politicians i mean uh you know, it, it's, it needs the rebelliousness of artists to, to keep reminding people that, you know, painting is a very relevant thing, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, the po politicians want people to be entertained, uh, mainly because they're, they're, then they are uh, not rioting. You know, they want us to be um, uh, silenced by art. Uh, they're quite happy for us to be sedated in some way, uh, but, uh, so, so, so they try and not uh, show the controversial art, the art that kind of can stir up revolution. Uh, but you know, uh, that's the job of all the museums and the um, art schools. And uh, I remember reading this book when I was, you know, art uh, art schools should be the centre of any city because they're the home of creativity. They are the most creative place in any city. So important. Uh, uh, so it's us jobs. So the listeners, everyone who's an artist who's listening, I hope many are artists. Uh, let's start the revolution of of making governments listen to, to us. And let's and painting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like painting when it has a political edge. I don't want painting to be even. I have to admit that I go to most portrait exhibitions and they just feel like. I mean, historical ones, Edwardian portraits, and it just feels like. Just people's egos, you know, averagely painted, really, in the scheme of things, and people's egos, uh, and 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 upholding uh, certain racist viewpoints. Uh, the most racist images, uh, going back to area, which I like, is reappropriating thing. You know, in the pose of Queen Elizabeth the first, he's putting a black face there. It's very good that he's taking that and making uh, questioning all those values because there has been uh, uh, the most racist images in the history of art were around the 19th century, right to the beginning of the 20th century, kind of posters used in early advertising uh, for minstrel shows and um, uh, really like horrific stuff. I mean, I, I can't I don't describe them all because uh, they started off because people were trying to justify slavery. To justify yeah. slavery, you had to dehumanize people, to, to, to not make them human beings. So there is soap, the pear soap has an image of a white man scrubbing off the black out of a black man's face. Just incredibly racist, hideous stuff. And you think that's happened in the 20th century. But we actually think that, that racism went on from like, you, you look at the 16th century images of black people and they were in uh, the three Magi paintings. They were in, they were kings. They were dressed as noble people. It, it's actually in the 17th century uh, that the first kind of images of the black man as savage started to appear. And it was at, at the beginning of the, the main height of slavery. It was, how do you as a Christian nation, I didn't mean to religious thing, how do you as a Christian uh, uh, kill your neighbor? You know, love your neighbor. How do you justify it to yourself that you can dehumanize people to, to use them like animals? And so the art corresponded to, to, the, to the visual language of, of trying to sell, to justify slavery. And mm -hmm. when slavery was abolished, it, it, uh, it, well, transatlantic slavery, because slavery has, is still around today. It hasn't gone slavery, but transatlantic slavery, just, it, uh, th those still stereotypes about black people and people of, of color were in everywhere because it took ages I grew up in the 70s in England. There was still these things, the black and white minstrel show on television, gollywogs and these things that were all part of this, that came out of slavery, all, these, all this kind of propaganda. And, uh, and so, so I'm just saying, uh, what, what, what Aria is doing is powerful. Uh, when I saw his work, I was moved by it because he's like bashing all these questions on the head, you know, he's fighting back, you know. And, uh, and so what's the role of painting? is there to to, to 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 change the world like i said i mean it, it sounds grandiose but i said it uh, you know i'll just say one thing the, the sistine chapel by michelangelo 
change the world. The world never looked back. Uh, I'm sure paintings by Paul Arrego now or, or works by Louise Bourgeois, they're changing the world right now as well. You know, uh, <laughs> artists have a profound effect because they affect the young. Uh, they inspire new generations. And, and, and what they give them in their hand is freedom to, to discover their own voice. And, and that's change. I mean, that's, that's what I want. I mean, uh, generally, I always say I love the company of artists, even if we don't like each other's art in, mm -hmm. in life. It doesn't matter because we're not going to like each other's art. Artists are very peculiar with their taste, really. But I actually love artists. Uh, I'll always know there'll be some nice olives put on the table and a nice piece of bread and a nice some nice wine because they've got good taste, you know. That's the one thing I know about artists. They've got very good taste. Uh, and um, I love spending my time around them, you know. Hence, I've got so many artist friends, by the way. I, I like people in general. I, I'm a people. I'm just saying that. <laughs> just to ask that about painting today. That's, that's for me. It's a very important thing still. Well, not just painting, conceptual art, all the art, video art, all the arts. Uh, so all roads lead to Rome. You know, if, if we want to make our entrance as a Caesar on our chariot, mm -hmm. well, the whole world needs to go and give and bring their vision to the world. And you know, it's a very important time. I think we're more we're needed more than ever. The arts are needed, but the money's being taken away. I mean, uh, no money in the arts. You know, I mean, it's a hard time for a lot. I mean, it is for the very top big names, but a lot of galleries are going to be, I mean, it's, it's going to be a terrible time. I'm not trying to, it's going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible time right now. Uh, so we have to go back to the grassroots and that's, uh, you know, create, let, let, let's, let's, let's create our way out of this mess and let's, let's do things. Uh, let's, let's do shows again in warehouses and let's do this, let's do that. Let's, let's bring back the avant-garde, you know, the avant-garde is a wonderful thing, you know, uh, and uh, it's been, you know, it's been taken over by corporates uh, in the last 20 years. It's, we're sold the avant-garde now as a kind of perfume, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's so corporate. Let's take the artists can bring back the avant-garde, you know, it, we have the magic carpet, we have, uh, it's, it's up to us, you know, because it's going to be a hard time after COVID. I, I don't know what the art's going to look like. How, I mean, already theatres are closing, music venues are closing, many art galleries will close, you know. Uh, but like it can be a renaissance, it can be a rebirth. It, it doesn't have to be, that sounds pessimistic, but there's hope, you know, there's hope. Uh, we are the hope, you know, we are the future. And it sounds cliche, I mean, I know that's a song, but uh, we are, we are the hope, all of us. And we have a very important role to do is spread the creativity, pass it on, encourage it in yourself and in others. Uh, uh, because like I said, it, most art revolutions are, are done, uh, all of them, even the ones in the German school in the 80s or 70s, eight people, 10 people. It doesn't need thousands. It's like a kind of Chinese whisper. Everyone says saying the same thing, but somehow it evolves into different voices. Because, you know, and it just needs us all to be whispering to each other the hope, the freedom. Uh, very, I mean, okay, my parents were hippies. But that could be uh, partly why I have those views, but it's always held me. It's, it's, I always felt that you only possess that which you, you, which you have after a shipwreck. So, and, you know, you might lose everything. And th there's a very famous Sufi story called about Leila Majnun. And it's a woman that... Uh, you know, was about to be married and she was on a ship and the ship gets wrecked and she lands in one place. And this is a, a land where they only have, uh, they only do weaving. So she learns to weave and she's getting well known. And then another thing happens, she's another shipwreck. Uh, then she's a land of carpenters and she learns to, 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 to make things, you know, she becomes a very good carpenter. And then she goes to another, another shipwreck and then she meets architects. And, and then she arrives in a land where they have water, but they don't know how to, 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 to take all their lovely vegetables and food to other places. And she's got all the skills now to make ships, you know, and, and, and that's why I said you only possess that which you have after a shipwreck. And it's a very optimistic thing in, in, a, in a pandemic like this. Uh, you know, there's hope, a lot of hope. 
And perhaps on this point that there is hope and art changes the world, we can uh, we can wrap up um, unless the panel has any more questions or follow ups. Yes. Yeah, Rhonda. Yes. Sorry, I, I just want to thank you for saying that, Nahim, because um, I was at a really great webinar yesterday. Um, and it was uh, exploring how uh, creativity in the arts um, really have has been helping young people in schools um, negotiate this uh, terrible social crisis in which we're in. And I have to say that, you know, art really is powerful in terms of how we can readdress the balances and the issues in society. And I think we all need to hold on to that. And thank you so much for bringing this exhibition to Southampton as well, which is, as we know, a very culturally diverse city and one in which I'm really proud thank to you. live in. So thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. It's been a great thank you. Thank you for coming to talk to us, Nahem. I, I think everybody will agree in, in thinking that, you know, you, you are a wonderful speaker and uh, you've given uh, us a lot of time to discuss really, really important uh, issues, actually. And thank you. For the panel, uh, I I really enjoyed this conversation, and I really hope that is a start uh, for or for a lot of us, and can be continued in other places. And um, thank you for the audience. Uh, to the audience, I mean, I I want to clap, but it's going to be virtual. Um, exactly. But yeah. thank you to everybody uh, for uh, attending. Uh, I believe I uh, there should be a slide coming up with with the next event. Uh, here it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next event is going to be next Tuesday, 20th of October at 5.30. We're going to uh, uh, show the award-winning film Beyond There is Always a Black Issue Deer. Um, so we're going to watch the film and then there's going to be uh, a Q&A with uh, the director of the film, uh, uh, Claire Laurie, and some of the actors and models that we see in the film. So um, thank you again to um, Nahem and all the panel and thank you for everybody for attending and we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks you too, Valentina. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs>